Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today at the National Museum of the American Indian in our beautiful Rasmussen Theater. My name is Hayes Lavis, and I am fortunate enough to work at this beautiful museum. We are in the second day of our Living Earth celebration. This program has been happening for more than eight years now, and each year it features a different food from somewhere in the Americas. This year, we are featuring cacao, or more commonly known, chocolate. We're very fortunate to have Chef Natali with us today to give a demonstration. And I'm, so let's give a very warm welcome to Chef Duran and to Sue McWilliams, who will be doing our moderation. Oh, and also, please silence all your cell phones or put them on vibrate. Thank you. How about now? There we go. Thank you everyone for uh, coming today. This is the, I guess this is the second time I'm here. Sue and I met back in 2014. And it's, uh, it's really great to be back. And uh, one of the things that I'm really passionate about is uh, food history. So I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I'm from Oaxaca, Mexico. Uh, my peoples are the, the Mixtec people or the Mixteco people uh, in the, or the New Savi, people from the rain, people from the clouds. And, uh, it's uh, one of the largest and oldest groups of people in, peoples in the Americas. Uh, it's, you know, uh, when the, in 1520, when the Spanish came to, came to Oaxaca, uh, there was probably a a lot, of, a lot of our peoples died, probably about 85% of the population, which was in the millions. Uh, ever since, obviously, we've rebounded, very resilient peoples. And uh, in the U.S., there's a large population, so for population of us. The majority of, the majority of my peoples live in the, coast of, uh, in the Pacific coast, from, uh, Oaxaca, from uh, Oxnar all the way to the Northwest. Uh, the farthest I found people from my community is north of, uh, north of Seattle, an hour, about an hour north of Seattle, a uh, little town called Bellingham, which is like way up there. And uh, so you always, know, you always know where there's people from Oaxaca, but there's, because if there's a restaurant from Oaxaca opening, that means that there's a population there. That means the people from Oaxaca are, are, are around. Uh, in the, in Oxnard, California, it's uh, one of the counties with the uh, one of the counties where there's a lot of us, there's 25,000 of us in one county. So that's a, you know, that's a really big uh, population. Am I talking too much? So? No, not at <laughs> all. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit more about Oaxaca and its different peoples that are within Oaxaca. I think that's interesting and how that's interpreted in the moles. Oh yeah, absolutely. So Oaxaca, we have in one state, uh, with, uh, geographically, it's pretty big, and uh, when it comes to people, there's 14 groups of us. So uh, some of the biggest ones, the biggest ones are going to be the Mixtec and the Zapotec. But then you have a, a wide range of uh, other of other communities with a variation of at least 56 different languages. So people like me, I don't. By the way, one of the one of the one of the things why I'm, I'm so interested in. in in my culture is because I don't speak my language. Um, not only uh, through colonialism, a lot of us lost our language because it wasn't okay to speak our language, but also if you intermarry with other communities, most likely, most likely you're gonna, you, at some point you, lose, you, you will lose your language. My uh, grandfather was Mixteco, my grandmother was Zapotec, so when they married, they couldn't communicate in their, in their own language. So. You, you, they, lost, uh, they lost the ability to speak the language, and, uh, and at the same time, this was probably like um, the 30s, 40s, 50s, where it wasn't okay for people like us, like us to speak our language. So my mother's generation, there's only a couple of my uncles that speak Mixtec, but my mom doesn't. And the very interesting thing is that my generation now, uh, I'm trying to learn and there's two of my sisters that are fluid in Zapotec. But it's, you know, 
we're trying to regain our culture, and that's uh, and culture and food, um, language and food is one of some of the most important ways to to retain your culture and to learn a culture. Uh, so today you're going to be making an interesting thing called an emolata, mm -hmm. which uh, we can get into the fact that it's kind of thought of as a Oaxacan street food. That's one thing I've heard about it as. You know, the, Has and, anyone and made it's left any emoladas here before? Anyone? No? So, uh, mole. Let's look, let's look briefly. Yeah, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to get my oil going. And let's talk about a little bit about mole. Mole is a perfect example of cultures clashing and creating something beautiful. Uh, a lot of the spices in, in, in mole are not spices native to the Americas. Came from Europe, came from India. Uh, a lot of the spices in, in Oaxacan cooking usually come uh, Northern Africa through the Moors, and then the Spanish bring them to, bring them to Mexico. Uh, when, when we get those ingredients, something through, throughout hundreds of years, you, 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 come out, you get to something that looks like this, that is, a, that is really, a, we're talking a, a, little bit about a, lo, a little bit about this yesterday. Um, chocolate is not a mole sauce. Chocolate, uh, chocolate is an ingredient, should be an ingredient in the mole, but not a main, not, a, not even a main component. The main components are gonna be, are gonna be chiles. So, uh, a lot of, in this, in, this, in this mole right here, there's probably about 28 ingredients. This is my family's mole that I got last week. And uh, there's probably 28 ingredients, one of them being cacao or chocolate. This one, mole negro, is it's a little bit more spicy. So, uh, so it's not very sweet, but there is a hint of sweetness through the layers. A, a good way to... Uh, to understand Mexican food, or food from, food from Oaxaca, is that there's gotta be different layers. It's, it's not supposed to just be spicy. There's gotta, it's gotta build up in your mouth, and you're, you're supposed to be able to taste different things. And it also has a lot to do with how you cook it, how you add the ingredients, um, how long you cook it, correct? How correct, and one of the things, uh, there's now, now it's a little bit more common to, to talk about this term, um, but we call it Mexican charring or Mexican toasting, which, which means that if, for European chefs, if you put tomatoes in, in the oven until they're like almost burned, they'll be like, what are you doing? You, you can't do that. But for us, if you think about how you make sal really good salsas, it's, it was traditionally made in a comal over the fire, and you put the tomatoes direct, direct on, top of, on top of the comal, and that's how you develop, how, that's how you develop the, the flavor, right? I, I see my sister here agreeing with me. That's how you develop the, fl the flavor. For, for a European chef, that would be unacceptable to like char a, char a tomato. For us, that's the essence of our cooking. Um, same thing with chiles for mole. You toss, you're gonna harvest the chiles, you're gonna dry them in the sun, and then eventually you're gonna toss them on top of the, on top of the comal, and then blend them, blend them into a paste like this with everything else. Uh, so, the, all, the whole process of every ingredient has a purpose. And does that uh, char or caramelization bring out the sweetness in the tomatoes? Yes, I'm sorry. I'm That's so okay. Boiling here. Two things at once. I understand. <laughs> um, yeah. So you bring the uh, you caramelize the, the, the tomatoes, but also you're uh, uh, you, you're developing different flavors and getting rid of the water, getting getting rid of the liquid, the, the water in the tomatoes. Mm -hmm. Reduction, intensity of flavor. So uh, when Neff submitted the recipe, we have this description that I, I think you'll all enjoy. The closest we might get in an English translation is that which has been mollified. 
So obviously, mole, uh, there's a reverence for the ingredients and the method and how it is celebrated and served during celebrations, um, and specifically weddings. Mm -hmm. Mole is a very traditional, uh, traditional food for, for celebrations. Uh, weddings, quinceañeras, baptisms, uh, town, uh, town celebrations. Every town in, in Mexico and Oaxaca will probably have a patron, a patron saint. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's, a, there's a term called tequio, where a, when there is, and this is, in the indigenous communities, this is usually normal, a, a normal way of coming together, which means, tequio means if, there, if, your, if your daughter is getting married, most likely there's gonna be mole. And, there's, uh, and you're gonna need, need a lot of hands. So usually, pe it's usually people come together and uh, slaughter the animals, make mole, make tortillas, and it just becomes this big celebration of life, really. Uh, because uh, one of the ways that we celebrate life is by eating and by, by enjoying the, the different things from, uh, the, the different things that, from nature. Um, and moladas is, the last is the last uh, the last thing that you can do with the leftover mole. So after you, after there was a party, many people came and were were really happy. You end up with leftover mole. So you don't ever want to waste that because you know it took a, it took a lot of time and labor to make that to make the mole. So this is one of the ways to utilize the the leftover mole. So is it possible to buy mole already prepared here in the United States? Yes. Uh, someone here from, here from the museum in the kitchen we went and bought this, this right here in D.C., a place called Megamart. Yeah, Does Megamart. that sound familiar? So it's possible to, uh, to, buy, uh, to buy your mole, uh, already, your mole paste already, already made. There is other place, other place online where you can order it too as, as well, or a... Uh, if you're lucky enough, maybe you can go to Oaxaca and then just bring, bring some back. So what I'm, gonna, uh, what I'm doing right now is I'm waiting for my oil to be ready. Uh, I'm going to lightly fry the, uh, fry the tortillas. And while I do that, I'm going to start uh, I'm gonna start the mole on this side. And feel free to ask some questions. I feel a little bit on the spot over here. Well, I was wondering if we could bat back and forth with what we know might possibly be in a mole. Um, so a mole negro is going to have at least three different chiles, guajillo, pasilla, and a, um, chihuacle. That's a, those are the three, the three basic, basic moles, and then a lot of different spices. This one right here uh, has mulatto, pasilla, ancho. Uh, it, this one has chocolate. It has sugar cane, actually, that it, it, it traditionally wouldn't have. Cinnamon, sesame seeds, almond vegetables, uh, vegetable oil, cilantro seeds, raisins, spices, natural, and, and other natural flavors. Um, those are some of the, some of the same ingredients that, 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 this, that this would have. Obviously, it has a lot more spices. And one of the thickening agents for a mole like this is gonna be a, same thing. There's always a purpose for everything in the kitchen. Uh, all tortillas that you don't eat, that are like left, left over, you're gonna toss them and grind them into, into this as a thickening agent. So I'm gonna get these ones going uh, while I wait for this. I have some chicken stock here. Reduced, <laughs> obviously. Very thick. Very thick chicken suck because this one is from Freddy here at the museum. And it's obviously a concentrator. Right, Freddy? Did he leave? Reduction. So I'm going to add sesame seed, pumpkin seed, almonds, plantains, tomatillos. Mm -hmm. What else? Um, Cinnamon. Cinnamon, almonds, cacao or chocolate, 
uh, either bread or tortilla, and then a lot of love. If you think about, and, and you know, and that's, that's also true, you know, if you think about the amount of time that it takes to make a mole, it's not something that you're gonna do every day from scratch, but it's also not something that, uh, it's something that you're gonna, you're, that you're, that you're gonna, that you're gonna do because you really love someone or you, or you really want to celebrate something. It's not something that you just like, you know. Special occasion food. Special occasions, definitely. Since this, uh, this is really concentrated, I'm just gonna add some water. While you're waiting for that to mix and uh, get warm, I wondered if you'd talk a little bit about your work these days in uh, the policy change for safe foods, abundant foods, sustainability, fair trade. Yeah, what would you like to know? I mean, well, <laughs> uh, <laughs> they. Uh, so about two years ago, I walked away from uh, I walked away from from my business. I literally just walked away, uh, handed over the keys to uh, the keys to the landlord, and left. And uh, and I is one of the greatest decisions I've ever made uh, because uh, if you grow up if you grow up in Oaxaca, um, even though Oaxaca is a beautiful place and. Uh, with so much culture and so much, uh, such rich, richness of culture, uh, there's also a lot of need because there's uh, indigenous communities have, have been marginalized for so long. The, there's a lot of poverty and a lot of uh, hunger. So about, about a couple of years ago, I walked away from, from my business from cooking uh, full time and, I, and, my, and my passion became something that is called food justice. Is everyone familiar with this term? A, a, a way for me to explain food justice is like I, I, I strongly believe that everyone deserves good food regardless of where you live or how much money you make. That's the basics of the work that I, that I do nowadays. Everyone should have access to, should have access to good food. And obviously in the, in the U.S. even though, we, um, you know, don't get, don't get me started with this. It's unconscionable that in 2017 there's 46 million people that, are, that don't make enough money to buy food. And the irony there is that a lot of these people are people that work with food. People that cook our food, people that pick our food, people that work in restaurants or anywhere in the food chain. They cannot afford to buy food. So a lot, a lot of the, uh, some of the work that I do when it comes to policy is to make sure that we, uh, that we are working together uh, towards, uh, towards a change for that. Uh, there's one part that I'm really passionate about is school food. School food is one of the main meals that our children are gonna eat every day. And more often than not, that food is not that good. I don't know, where, there's some districts that are better, better than others, but usually the kids don't wanna eat that food. Mm -hmm. And if that's one of your main meals throughout the day, throughout, throughout the day you know, and, and that food is not good, you know, a lot of children go, go to bed hungry or, not, or are not eating the right, uh, the right food. And one thing that is important to recognize is that uh, a lot of uh, issues in, there's a lot of uh, illnesses re related to food, especially in the Latino and indigenous communities. Uh, you know, you can go through the list, hypertension, diabetes, on and on and on. And a lot of those illnesses are, are you can, pre you can prevent them by, by uh, not only by, uh, um, well, I'm gonna say by eating better, but uh, having access to good food. And if our children, from, uh, from the moment they start, going, they start going to school, don't have good food, good health food, are gonna grow up uh, to have some health issues. That's just the reality of it. There has been a lot of, uh, during the last administration, there was a lot of um, a lot of progress when it came to school food. Uh, more and more gardens ha were being built. 
Um, the nutrition stand standards changed a little bit for the better. So there's, a, there's been some progress, mm -hmm. and uh, right now, you know, we're going to have to um, push hard on those, uh, on those issues. But I, uh, I believe, the, it will be, I strongly believe that if we all know about those issues, we care about food, right? There's, I've only met in my whole career, I probably met a couple of people that said, they straight up said, I don't care about food, I just get it. But most of us have a connection to food, whether it's remembering how your grandma cooked, your Sunday meals, your family meals, what you ate when you went on vacation, you know, all of us have, have those memories. Memories. Yeah. While I wait for this, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get my onions ready and my parsley. So maybe you could tell folks uh, why you peel the first skin off of the onion. Um, the paper part of it that yeah. never cooks. Yeah, so, you know, you definitely don't want to eat that. <laughs> so this, this onion, I'm just gonna, uh, you'll, get, you'll see what I'm gonna do with this, but I'm just gonna make some uh, really thin slice. I'm, I'm gonna put them on the side. Is that cilantro? I have cilantro and parsley. And obviously, the uh, same thing, you know, you can use whatever you have available. I believe there's gonna be some recipe cards. And, uh, and it, it probably calls for, for parsley, but if what you have is cilantro, you can always, always use cilantro. Except for that, uh, you know, there's some people that cannot, uh, they don't like cilantro. You guys know someone like that? Yeah? yeah. And apparently it's, apparently it's uh, something to do with uh, I mean, genetics. it tastes like, yeah, it, it tastes like, like soap, soap to, to some people. Right? Cilantro tastes like soap or metal. I don't, doesn't to me, so. I feel bad for them. <laughs> I was going to go back to the uh, nutrition in schools, add two facts. And I think most of you still know ketchup is counted as a vegetable. And, uh, the, the last administration did change a requirement in whole grains. And, um, you know, having taught in public high school for a dozen years, I can tell you, you don't want anybody who hasn't eaten all day because they'll fall asleep. And the difference between eating some whole grain and eating a honey bun with sugar and white flour in the morning is brain power. Um, so, you know, my argument on the food in the schools is that you're there to learn and you should be an efficient machine to do so and it would help to eat correctly. Um, I know in our high school, until they really ruled out the sugar sodas and the trashy snacks, most kids had an orange soda and hot fries for lunch. What about breakfast? No breakfast. Well, well, but, but children, the children, they, they get school food. Most more likely, they're gonna eat something really sugary. Right. First thing in the morning. What happens if you if you eat sugar at seven o'clock in the morning? You're gonna be so hyper. And then you're gonna crash at about eleven o'clock, right on and your desk. And then what happens to those kids? They are disturbing the class. No, and it's all food related. Because they, if they had, if those kids had the option to like eat an egg, eat, you know, eat a real egg, or uh, and, uh, and a piece of bread or a tortilla, they, they, you know, they, they won't be so hyper at first thing in the morning. So there are some programs in, I live in Massachusetts, by the way, and there are some programs that we have, that we're testing. One of them is breakfast in the classroom. Breakfast, uh, breakfast in the classroom is just that: uh, you bring food to the classroom. And the first, thing, the first thing that happens when the kids get there is they have breakfast. And they're supposed to help uh, each other. Uh, they, they, there's a rotation and the kids uh, open the bags and uh, 
give everyone the breakfast and they clean up and uh, they clean up and then uh, the day starts. It makes a real, uh, it, make, it makes a big difference, not only when kids uh, eat something that is good for them, but also they have a little bit of structure of, uh, of, helping, or of helping each other, each other out and uh, going on rotation. It really makes a difference when you have something good to eat in the morning. Um, I have a really bad, bad habit of not eating breakfast, uh, but I know that at some point during the day, if I don't eat something, I'm going to be cranky. I have a question. Yes. Google healthy schools, and there must be a dozen websites. So the Chefs Move to school, Schools movement, which was Michelle Obama's, um, one of her focuses, um, changed and... Ender is here. What was that? Here for our Southern U... Oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> Who's talking? Anyways, Google Healthy Schools, and uh, there was a lot of work done and a lot of effort made by thousands of chefs across the United States who partnered with nutritional experts to really look at, um, you know, how to even bring it home. You know, you have to be taught to take care of yourself, and you have to, you know, it's not always somebody else's fault. It's you making the right choice. And I think a, especially a kid has a, has a problem with the peer pressure. And there's nothing wrong with eating junk food once in a while, as long as you offset it by knowing that, you know, you do need to eat something green. Yeah, where do you live? New York City. New York City. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll be happy to send you some resources, but there's a... There's a, there's a project called, uh, I don't know if it changed name, but it's called uh, Food and Fitness. And it's, a, and it's a community project that looks at the whole community. So yes, need, kids need, need to learn how to make better choices, but more importantly, we have to recognize that a lot of kids like in communities like Har Harlem, are not, there's not enough choices. Um, my friend Leah Pennyman, who's this really amazing black farmer, uh, tells the story about how she brings uh, upstate New York, she brings kids from the city, and they're like, but Miss Leah, you know, if I only have $2 and I, and, and, and I go to the bodega, I can get the purple drink and the potato chips. For $2, you cannot get other stuff. If, if, even if they, had other, uh, if they ha even if they had other options. Part of that, part of the project, uh, part of project, different projects around the country is so called something a healthy corner source, in which uh, bodegas get uh, are encouraged to uh, to carry fruit, whether it's bananas, apples, simple stuff, the people the the kids can can access. Yeah, that's just started here in D.C. in Langley Park, and there's uh, two dozen bodegas who are now offering healthy food for kids. So alternatives to sugary sodas and things. Yes? You know, I'm a teacher as well, at least retired. But you know, one of the factors is that it's not the healthy food. You can have all kinds of healthy food. There's a lot of healthy food. And you know what's happening to it? It goes right in the trash. You know why? Because people can't cook it. All right? So I'm sorry about Right. I think it's a real grassroots effort to go into communities and teach people how to cook again, too. And it's also, I mean, this is what we're talking about today. It's, it's culture and maintaining that culture and handing it down from generation to generation. It's also a reverence for food, where your food comes from, supporting fair trade, and as 
as we've heard from Neff today, you know, just the effort to make a mole sauce. And I think we all have that, whether it's we share a Thanksgiving dinner or another ritual within the year or your culture. Um, it's the sharing of food that's also something that we need to make sure we don't lose. You know, there's also a movement just to be at the table and turn off your devices. <laughs> but so, I, I, I agree. We don't cook enough. I absolutely agree. And I think the, uh, um, I teach uh, four classes every throughout the week. Um, we take teenagers out of the high school and they come to me. They come to my kitchen, we have a farm, you know, we're really lucky that we have space for them to come and learn how to cook. If at the end of the semester they learn how to make a quesadilla, rice and beans, and a, and a salad, I'm winning. Yes. Right? Because, uh, because yeah, uh, oftentimes people, families don't have enough time to cook or don't have access or money to buy the good ingredients. Uh, but it's something that we need to do more. We all need to, uh, to, cook, to cook a little bit more. I and I think most teenagers agree. are empowered by learning how to cook. They think yeah. it's pretty cool to, you know, this have semester, these survivor techniques. This semester, uh, this semester we had three teenagers that were really into, se into seafood, three boys. Uh, the rest of the class, not so much, but three boys that were really into seafood and sriracha, hot sauce. And they wanted to make, uh, they wanted to make uh, sushi rolls. So what we did is we took them to a different city, took them to a big Asian grocery store, and we taught them how to go and buy the rice, the, the seaweed, the whole thing. And, then, and the next day they made their own, their own sushi. I strongly believe that those kids are gonna remember that for the rest of their lives. Because now, now they know that they can make their own rolls, and they don't have to buy them. But, uh, but we're lucky enough that we can do that. Yes? Well, those, it wasn't really in the indigenous culture because it was government given food that gave them lard and fry bread. Yeah, yeah here and now, it, yeah, it is. It's a problem. I love, I love your question, and I have a really, uh, you know, I disagree with a lot of people about, about uh, fry bread in the sense that at some point I understood. Uh, and there's, there's, a, there's, there's a really wonderful academic, pa academic paper that I can send you, but it wasn't until I, I read that that I finally understood uh, not only the rest of food and the, the indigenous people started eating a lot more uh, fried bread out of necessity because it, what, what, what was in that? It was flour, lard, uh, salt, so you could make, uh, uh, you could make fried bread. Now, Nowadays, there are, you know, there are more options that there's a big movement to get away from that. One thing that is important to recognize that is that uh, it has become our comfort food, right? All of our memories of our food are really close to our heart, all of them. And if you grew up eating fried bread, that's your comfort food. And it, and it, it becomes part of uh, it becomes part of that, of that comfort. So to, to tell people to just not do it, is, it's really hard. But maybe there's an opportunity to start moving away, away from it slowly, even, even just starting to change, change some of the ingredients, some of the toppings, whatever it is. But it's a really hard conversation to have, because, especially because of, because of that, because it, it's become a really, uh, something that is emotional. Right? <laughs> but I agree, we have to, we have to, we have to get away from, from that. Uh, but even uh, most, in, especially in the Southwest and the Midwest, most reservations are gonna be really isolated from, uh, from, gro from grocery stores and stuff, so that's why it's still, you know, still available. So it's interesting if we bring this back to what you're making now, 
what you're doing is extending the use of something you've made. Mm -hmm. And I suppose we could argue that maybe the oil isn't that great for you, but if it's a stone ground tortilla, and you know, you're gonna show us what you're gonna do with the rest of it, but it's a fairly healthy snack. Except for the frying a little bit. Except for Absolutely. Yep. Yep. And just really fast. Yeah. Yep. Just to just to soften it up. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. That's what I, that's how we do it at home. So what I'm what I'm gonna do right now is uh, I don't know if you guys can see. So I have my mold here. Do you see it? My mole here is ready. It's a little bit more. Uh, what makes it so shiny? Uh, all the cacao. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's this. This is ready to go. Um, obviously, uh, if you if you were doing making making this at home, depending on the uh, on the size of the family, if you needed to. Uh, you, if you needed to feed more people, you can always add, add a little bit more chicken stock or water to make it last longer. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start dropping the, uh, the tortillas into the, into the mole. And we're just going to let them let him coat and get a little bit soft. And one thing that I'm missing here today um, is the queso fresco, but we do have some crema. So queso fresca is a fresh cheese, and it crumbles easily. Uh, it's it's tart. What else would you say about it? Cream. Well, it's mm -hmm. and it's delicious. <laughs> and you can find it at. Nowadays, you can find it at most at most grocery stores, yeah. really, all over the U.S. The, uh, the Latino market, the, you know, the Latino foods are almost uh, are everywhere. The queso fresco has become a staple at almost all the stores. So if we wanted, if we did want to make this into a healthier dish, what would happen if we served it over a big salad? You can always, yeah, or you can always uh, make an, uh, a really nice salad on the side. Mm -hmm. So what I have here is my enmoladas. And obviously, obviously uh, you guys are familiar with enchiladas. You can also do the same thing. Like you can roll them, put them in a, in a, in a, sheet tray, in a big plate, and then instead of putting them in there, you can also just cut it. I like this, this version better because the whole tortilla gets soft. And, you know, but it's up to you. Are we doing on time? We're fine. So the onion is, is gonna give it a really nice crunch, and, uh, and it's also gonna, uh, gonna balance the, the richness of the mole. Some cilantro. Actually, this is parsley. Some parsley in there. And then same thing as queso fresco, you can always buy a crema. Uh, this one is also from one of the local grocery stores here. Uh, but Mexican crema is pretty, uh, is pretty common too. Mm -hmm. There's lime and uh, what else is in it? Lime and something else makes it tart. Maybe right. it's just it's salt? It's cultured too. Oh, it's cultured. So it's a lot like sour cream, mm -hmm. but more you liquid. You can also substitute for sour cream if you, if you like. So or yogurt. This is, I don't know if you can see this, this is my version of, uh, 
of Enmoladas is a, um, I've learned how to say it's a simple dish, but it's not a, it's a simple dish that has, the dish that has a lot of history behind, behind it. Uh, obviously, you know, as we said before, mole is one of those uh, mother sauces that, is, that took a long time to develop, and, uh, and there's a lot of history on that. If you think about moles, we, I usually refer to moles as the mother sauces of, of the Americas. The French have their mother sauces. Do you want to remind me? Uh, bechamel, velote, uh, where am I? A couple more. <laughs> so anyways, uh, in Oaxaca, we have the seven moles. Uh, and uh, you have negro, you have rojo, you have coloradito, uh, amarillo, uh, green mole, and then there's a couple of white moles too. And there's a mole for every, for every, for every protein, for every dish. Uh, the, and it's really, it, it really depends on, on what you want to eat. For example, a uh, uh, white mole, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a white bean, white beans that are grounded and with spices, and it's and it's a really delicious one that is not very common. Uh, there's another one, another white mole, the uh, white mole that you can add almonds to it, and it's really creamy and really delicious. Uh, my favorite one is probably uh, pepian, pepian, which is the tomatillos with pumpkin seeds. That's the basis of it and then chilies and other spices. That one is one of my favorite ones. Do you guys have something similar? Yeah. Uh, and uh, this one, uh, the mole negro, is uh, one of the most iconic ones with a lot of different, different ingredients. And probably this mole, this, this uh, mole negro and mole rojo are the, the moles that mostly resemble also the, the Indian curries because a lot, of the, a lot of the same ingredients. There's a whole history of like trade around the world and the spices are, all, are, are pretty similar. So those are the sister, the sister moles. I like this. I like especially the idea that there's seven moles and five mother sauces. <laughs> 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 and that's also the, the moles are, uh, as I said before, moles are a perfect example of uh, the creativity and resiliency of indigenous people uh, through the introduction of different ingredients, um, you get a lot of uh, you get a lot of different ingredients from all over the world coming coming via via Spain, and you cre and people created something beautiful and delicious, you know, and uh, it's it, it's quite remarkable. Yes. No. Um, well, the, the preparation takes a long time, but then, then after that, then after that, after that, once you cook it, um, it should, you know, it, it should cook for a few hours, but not for a long time, or at some point, it's gonna, it's gonna start burning. And one of the main, one of my, one of the main reasons why Oaxaca is, the, is made only for some special occasions, because there is gonna be someone. Over standing over, over over a big pot, and the, their whole job is to to stir it, <laughs> right? Um, however, there is a Mexican chef in Mexico City, uh, this really uh, fancy restaurant named Pujol, who is actually um, what's the word that I'm fermenting. Um, He's leaving his mole to ferment for, a, for a, over a year, or up to a year, and then serving it. Uh, is there, there may be another word that I'm looking for that is not fermenting. Um, it's like when you have sourdough bread. The, it's for the, it's the, well, the it's fermentation, yeah. yes. Yeah. So he's doing that. But that's a relatively new, a new technique. So then how do you tell the mole from a mole? You can taste it. <laughs> but also, it, it, a really good way to uh, a really good way to tell, tell a, a mole that is uh, uh, if it's too sweet, if it's overpowering sweet, it's probably not 
not that good because they uh, they added too much chocolate to it, especially in the, especially in the U.S. Uh, as I said before, there there has to be different layers that build up in your mouth, and it, it, it can be spicy but not overwhelming. But you're supposed to be able to taste a lot of the spices, the almonds, the chocolate, not just the, not just sweetness. Any other questions? Yeah. 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 I mean, we've talked a lot over the last couple of days about the flavor of cacao, and mole certainly highlights that, which is it, it's so complex, and a good cook will know how to balance all those flavors together the acid, the bitter, the sweet, the sour, the. And that's what these ingredients do, and then the heat from the chili, but it's not so that when it's on your palate, you only taste one thing. That, would, that wouldn't work. It just extends like a good chocolate. Yes. You have a question? Actually, tortilla is a really good example of, since we're at the museum, I, I, I can get to geek out and, uh, about a tortilla. Think about this, tortilla uh, is the, a tortilla that we eat today, there's 10,000 years of history right here. And I'm gonna tell you why. It starts, with, it starts with agriculture in the Americas. In Mesoamerica, Oaxaca, Puebla, uh, about nine, 95, 9,500 years ago, people, uh, people started uh, domesticating corn. Uh, which I, before, before, before corn as we know it, it was a wild grass called Teosintli. And uh, people started domesticating Teosintli into corn, which means that people uh, started, uh, started being able to stay in one place for a, long, for a longer period of time as opposed to moving around. It took probably about three to 4,000 years to, for them to figure out how to, uh, how to niche some allies. So corn itself, it's not a, we cannot process it as humans. There's not enough nutrition of it. So you need a, a you need to nixtamalize, uh, nixtamalize corn so that you, uh, so that you can, uh, so that, that you can have access to, to nutrition. In Mexico, in Oaxaca, probably about uh, 5,000 years ago, that happened with nixtamalization. Originally with ash. Ash is the, an alkaline solution that when you put corn together, you boil it, it breaks, it breaks down the enzymes, and then you can make a masa. We, 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 use, uh, we use ash first, and then eventually limestone. And limestone is, is what, what is used right now. For people in the north, ash is still being used. Not only in the southwest, but uh, all the way up north, the, the northern tribes. And it has, it's, it's, the same, it's the same thing. Um, when it comes to, so that happened about 5,000 years ago, and ar 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 around the same time, if you think about this, people started making tortillas, which means that they also need, needed to figure out how to, how to start, a, how to innovate on arts and crafts. So around the same period of time, you have comals and cooking pots and other, other different techniques. Moving forward now to the way we, the way we eat tortillas, most likely the, uh, if you go to Oaxaca or any other place in, cent in, in Central America, tortillas are really delicious. The main reason is that the corn is, uh, is, is very diverse and it's not, a, it's not from, a, from a monocrop. In the U.S., most of the corn that we, that we eat is just one kind, one kind of corn, right? So think about that. All of us right here, a good example, we're, we're really different. What happens if we were all the same, you know. We would like each other. Um, that's that's what's happening with corn in the U.S. It, there's not enough diversity, and if there's not enough, enough diversity, there's not enough flavor. There are some companies nowadays that are bringing corn from Oaxaca to the U.S., and you can taste the, you can taste the difference. Uh, if you grow your own corn in indigenous communities, most likely that's a very specific flavor of flavor that you're gonna get out of it. So. Uh, there are, and there are some, so many different uh, varieties of corn. 
Yeah. And, and they're all different, blue corn, red corn, mm -hmm. uh, yellow, white, and they're all different. So it's just a matter of where you live. Yeah, uh, I know that uh, there's uh, that Spanish chef that has a couple of Mexican restaurants, and they make their own. Uh, they make their own tortillas. So maybe you you should like compare whether that tortilla tastes better than something else. And there's also some corn I noticed for sale out in the museum, and it's a mix of corn, blue corn, three kinds of corn. I mean, you'd have to grind it. But, uh, and you know, I don't want to an open up a can of worms here, but monoculture, mono agriculture also supports GMOs. So then you're so far away from flavor, you know, I wonder if it's worth eating. So. Yes. Not at all. The, only, the first time cacao ever saw sugar was after the, when the Spaniards took it back to Europe. Cacao, it's, cacao itself is, is, should, it should be bitter. And, uh, and it balances with the other with the other spices. Nowadays, like in, in a mole like this, is gonna be chocolate, which will have some some sugar. Um, yeah. Well, what they have here is probably a, is probably cacao nibs. Which you can you can just eat because it's already been been toasted and it's ready and it's ready to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and grab some recipe cards because uh, Freddie, the, or the chef here at the museum, made a uh, a chocolate vinaigrette, and it's not sweet. It just has this background of of a cacao flavor. So. All right. Are we Great. all set? Thank you for coming. Thank all you right. so much. Yes. Thank you all for joining us today. Let's give Chef Neff another round of applause. It smells absolutely amazing. And also a warm thank you to our moderator, Sue McWilliams. <laughs>